You're listening ad-free on Amazon Music. On Thursday, October 18th, 2001, Amy St. Laurent stood in front of her clothes closet in the small main town of South Berwick. She had a big meeting coming up the next week at work, and she wanted to pick out just the right outfit. Amy was an attractive 25-year-old woman with strawberry blonde hair and blue eyes who wanted to become a model. She'd even gotten some professional photos done. But when it came to her job at Pratt & Whitney, which was an aircraft engine assembly plant, she wanted to be taken seriously. And that meant dressing professionally so that people didn't get the wrong idea from her looks and youth. But as Amy tried and rejected one outfit after another, she knew that the real reason she was making such a big deal out of this was to distract herself. She was trying to avoid thinking about the man who was coming to visit her that night from Florida. Amy had recently broken up with her boyfriend after living together on and off for five years. She wanted to get married and have kids, but she realized that her ex, Richard Sparrow, was just not the one. She liked to travel and go to museums, and the longer she'd been with Richard, the more she realized he was just a homebody who didn't care much about any of those things. She felt like breaking up with him was the right decision, but it was still hard. But now that she had broken up with him, she was able to rediscover the joy of being single. And a few weeks ago, she'd taken a trip to Florida, and she had met a handsome 27-year-old man named Eric Rubright, who had taken her out on his motorcycle. He'd even tried to kiss her, although Amy had politely declined. Ultimately, Amy had a lot of fun with Eric, and so when Eric asked if it was possible for him to travel to Maine to visit her, she said yes. But Amy was not interested in a romantic relationship again and she didn't want to lead Eric on. So she made it absolutely clear to him that when he visited in Maine, nothing romantic could happen between them, and he would have to sleep in the spare room. Eric said he was totally fine with that, but just in case, Amy had another safeguard planned for this visit that she didn't mention to Eric. Her ex-boyfriend, Richard, had offered to come over and hang out with them as a buffer, like a third wheel. And now, standing in her bedroom, thinking about how potentially awkward this three-way dynamic was going to be, Amy hoped she did not make a mistake in either inviting Eric or inviting Richard. That evening, Eric arrived at Amy's apartment, and right away, things got off to a bumpy start. Despite what he said, Eric did not seem thrilled about sleeping in the spare bedroom. And he was clearly annoyed that Amy's ex-boyfriend, Richard, was just at the house with them. And then on Friday, which was the second day of Eric's visit, Amy and Eric got into a little fight. By Saturday, October 20th, so the third day of Eric's visit, Amy was just tired of Eric's constant grumpiness and disappointment. She'd been very clear with him that she did not want a romance, so Amy decided that for the rest of the time Eric was visiting, she would just go out and do the things that she thought they both would enjoy, and you know what, if Eric didn't like it, then so be it. So Amy took Eric to Boston to go to the Museum of Fine Arts, which was one of Amy's favorite places, and then afterwards, they went out for a nice dinner. And Amy noticed Eric seemed to be having a much better time now. So as they were driving back towards Maine, Amy asked Eric if he was up for stopping in downtown Portland, which is a city in Maine. But as soon as Eric said yes, Amy immediately began worrying that she was underdressed for a big night out on the town. She was wearing jeans, sneakers, and a sweatshirt with her company's logo on it. She considered going home to change first, but at the same time, she didn't want to dress too provocatively and give Eric the wrong message, so she decided she would just go as is. Downtown Portland is a really popular spot, especially at night. And so when Eric and Amy got there, all the restaurants and bars that lined the cobblestone streets were packed, and mostly with young people. Amy suggested they stop at a sports bar, and Eric seemed interested... But as soon as they went inside, Eric began acting all disappointed again. Amy wanted to play a game of pool, like billiards, but Eric didn't. So Amy, determined not to have a terrible night, just went and found a couple of 20-something-year-old men named Russ and Cush who she could play with. Then the three of them would play and they would talk and laugh, while Eric just kind of awkwardly stood by, drinking a beer and looking bored. After a while, though, Amy started worrying that she was being rude to Eric. So she took him to get some pizza, and even paid for his slices herself. Then she asked if he wanted to go to a cool club called the Pavilion that was partly inside an old bank vault. Amy hoped that the Pavilion would impress Eric, but as soon as they walked in, he got that annoying bored look on his face again, and he immediately said he didn't want to dance. And at this point, Amy was just kind of over Eric, and so she left Eric standing in line for drinks while she headed for the dance floor all on her own. 
On Sunday afternoon, so the following day, Amy's mother, Diane Jenkins, drummed her fingers on her laptop inside of her South Portland home, trying to burn off some nervous energy. She was getting concerned about her daughter. Amy had called her mother around 10 p.m. the night before, and Diane could tell from the sound of Amy's voice that she was in good spirits. Amy had said that she and her friend Eric were driving downtown, and so she asked her mom if she wanted to join them for a drink, since she lived pretty close. But Diane was already in her pajamas, so she said no. But after that, Amy had not called again, which was odd because the mother and daughter talked every day. Diane picked up the phone again and called her daughter's cell phone, but it went to voicemail for the fourth straight time. Diane wanted to think that Amy was just busy with her weekend guest, Eric, but it had been hours and hours, and Amy never ignored her calls for this long. So Diane picked up her phone again, but this time she called her ex-husband, who was Amy's father. He lived close to Amy and took care of her cat whenever Amy was away for more than a few hours. But when Amy's dad picked up, he told Diane that he hadn't heard from their daughter either. And so Diane really started to worry that something could be wrong. The next morning, when still Amy had not called her mom, Diane called Amy's work. But the person who answered the phone call said Amy hadn't shown up. And she hadn't called ahead or emailed ahead to tell anyone why she was not coming into work. At this point, Diane felt a full-blown panic attack coming on as it dawned on her that her daughter truly had disappeared. And so Diane hung up on that call and then immediately called the police to report her daughter missing. That evening, which was October 22, 2001, Detective Danny Young flopped onto the sofa and flipped on Monday Night Football. It was the veteran detective's first night off since the 9-11 terror attacks on the World Trade Center in New York. For the past six weeks, Young had been investigating crimes by day for the Portland Police Department, and then by night, he and his bomb-detecting dog had been doing extra patrols, checking out the Portland Ferry for explosives, or checking out suspicious packages. And so at this moment, the detective's living room couch never felt so good. So when his phone rang a few minutes later, Detective Young wasn't sure if he even wanted to answer it. But he slowly did get off the couch, and he picked up. And on the other line was a deputy sheriff from the county who said he needed Detective Young's help. He told Detective Young that the daughter of one of his friends was missing after she had spent the evening with a guy from out of town. The sheriff told Young that the woman's name was Amy St. Laurent, and her mother had already filed a missing person report in Portland, and her family had already gone out and begun putting up missing person posters all over the place. But police had not launched a full-scale investigation yet because Amy was an adult and she had not been gone for very long. But this deputy was wondering if maybe Detective Young could help off the books. Detective Young wanted to say no because he was exhausted, but Amy's disappearance felt oddly personal to him. He had a daughter who was not only Amy's age, but shared the same name. And like Amy St. Laurent, Young's daughter also loved going to the Pavilion nightclub. As the deputy sheriff told Young more about Amy and why her family was so worried, Young's gut told him something was wrong here. So he told the deputy he would look into this. After the call with the deputy sheriff ended, Detective Young called a supervisor to tell him he was going to investigate this Amy St. Laurent case. But the supervisor thought this was a bad idea, that it was a waste of time. A 25-year-old woman disappearing after a night of partying was not exactly big news. Maybe she had a hangover, or maybe she met up with a guy and didn't want to come home quite yet. Ultimately, the supervisor felt like the chances that something bad had happened to Amy were pretty slim. Also, the supervisor pointed out that this was Detective Young's first night off in a really long time, and he needed to take a break. But Young was adamant that he wanted to do this, and so after some convincing, his supervisor let him launch his own unofficial investigation. Before Detective Young left his house, he called a sergeant at the police station. Since Amy's friend, who she was with the night she disappeared, Eric Rubright, was from out of town, there was a good chance he had rented a car. So, Detective Young wanted the sergeant to call the local rental agencies and see if any of them had a record of Eric renting a vehicle from them. And sure enough, the sergeant quickly called Young back. Not only did the sergeant know that Eric rented a maroon GMC Envoy, but she also had another important piece of information. The car Eric rented was equipped with a GPS tracker, which meant the rental company knew the vehicle's exact location in downtown Portland. Detective Young immediately sent some officers to stake out the rental car. And within an hour, Eric showed up right around 10.30 p.m. And strangely, he wasn't surprised to see the police officers at all. 
He told them he'd already seen the missing person posters that Amy's family were putting up all over Portland, and he said he was concerned about Amy too. And so the officers would take Eric back to the police station to ask him some questions. By the time Detective Young got to the interrogation room late that night, his fatigue from six straight weeks of work had disappeared. For the detective, it was like flipping a switch. The second he launched an investigation, it was the only thing he cared about, and he could focus like a laser beam no matter how tired he was. Eric was already sitting in the interrogation room, and the detective quickly sized him up. The first thing he noticed was how big Eric was. Eric had played semi-professional rugby, and Young thought how easy it would be for him to overpower someone Amy's size. But the second thing Young noticed was that Eric seemed agitated, like someone who was afraid he was in trouble. And as Detective Young peppered Eric with questions, Eric's story began to sound pretty odd. He claimed that on the night Amy was missing, they were at the Pavilion Club, and then after the last call, which was sometime between 12.45 and 1 a.m., Eric went to the bathroom, but he got stuck in a long line. And then by the time he got out of the bathroom, Amy had taken off, leaving him alone. So he got in his car and he circled the block once to see if he could find her. But when Amy didn't turn up, he decided that she would just have to find her own way home and he left. But what made this story so hard to believe was that according to Eric, Amy had left her wallet, cell phone, purse, and car keys in his car. Detective Young was about to ask Eric to explain this when someone knocked on the door. Young frowned, but he knew nobody would interrupt unless it was really important. So he excused himself and stepped out of the room. And once he had, an officer handed him a phone. And when Young put it to his ear, he heard his sergeant's voice. The sergeant said he was with three young men who had flagged down his patrol car to tell him they were with Amy the night she disappeared and they needed to talk to police right now. Detective Young told the sergeant to bring them in right away. But Detective Young had to get back to his interview with Eric, so he assigned other detectives to talk to the three young men and just report back to him. The three young men eventually arrived at the police station, and they introduced themselves to the detectives. They were Russ Gorman, Kush Sharma, and their other roommate. And obviously Russ and Kush were the two young men that Amy had played pool with on the night she went missing. And they would tell the detectives that recently a bartender had showed them the missing person poster of Amy, and they instantly recognized her as the woman they had played pool with. And so as soon as they saw it, they left the bar and flagged down the first patrol car they saw. Russ was a charming guy who had very stylized hair. He had frosted tips, which meant the ends of his hair, kind of all throughout his hair, were bleached blonde, and he gelled his hair up. And although he'd only been in Portland for 18 months, he was already a regular in the bar scene there. And he would tell the detective that he and his buddy Kush had been playing pool when Amy had come over and asked to join their game. And Russ would say that actually he and Amy hit it off right away, and he actually asked for her phone number. But Russ made it clear he did not expect this to go anywhere because he watched as Amy literally went back to her date, and so Russ and Kush just left and went to another bar. But then the two men went to the Pavilion nightclub, where sure enough, they ran into Amy again. This was around the time that Amy had gone to the dance floor on her own. She saw Russ and Kush, and the three of them basically started dancing together. And so Russ would tell the detectives that the three of them just danced all night. And then after last call, Russ said he wanted to keep partying, so he invited Amy to come back to their apartment. He told her they were going to have an after-hours birthday party for their third roommate, and he wanted Amy to join them. And so she agreed, and they all got to the apartment at around 1.15 a.m. But the birthday party never really materialized, and Russ could tell Amy was really bored. And so eventually he just asked Amy if she wanted a ride back home. And Amy actually said that she wanted a ride back to the pavilion because then she could go find her date, Eric, and he could give her a ride home. And if for some reason she couldn't find him, her mom's house was right nearby and she could just walk there. So at about 2 a.m., Russ dropped off Amy right outside the pavilion on the curb. And then after watching her head towards the pavilion, Russ just drove home and stayed there for the rest of the night. And when detectives spoke to the other two roommates, they would tell basically the exact same version of the story. The detectives were excited. It sounded like Russ may have been the last person to see Amy alive, and so they rushed to tell Detective Young what they had learned. Detective Young was still talking to Eric when the detectives knocked again on their door. And when Young stepped out and they told him what Russ and the roommate said, a new theory popped up in Detective Young's head. 
He wondered if maybe Eric saw Amy get dropped off by some other guy, and maybe that sent him into a jealous rage. But when Detective Young walked back into the interview room and sat down, he said nothing to Eric about what he had just learned. Instead, he asked Eric to go over all of his actions after Amy had left the club without him. Young wanted to see if he could maybe catch Eric in a lie. Eric claimed that after he realized Amy was gone, he just drove himself back to Amy's house and then let himself inside using Amy's key. But when he didn't find Amy inside, he said he felt weird about staying in her house all alone, so he slept outside in his car. The next morning, Eric said he left his car and went back inside of Amy's house to use her shower and also to drop off all her belongings she had left in his car. And then afterwards, he said he did leave an angry note pinned to her apartment door. And then he left her coat outside right on the hood of her car and he dropped her keys onto one of her tires. And that was the end of his weekend. When Eric stopped talking, Detective Young couldn't help but feel like this guy's story just seemed totally off. And soon, he would have yet another interruption that would confirm his suspicion. Suddenly, another detective called Young out of the interview room to tell him that Amy's neighbor had called her local police department on Sunday with her own concerns about Amy's safety. She'd seen Amy's expensive coat on the ground beside her car on Sunday morning, so she had knocked on Amy's door to see if she was okay. But it wasn't just the coat that made the neighbors nervous. On Friday night, the neighbor had seen Eric angrily peeling out of Amy's driveway, and when the neighbor actually asked Amy what was going on, Amy said Eric was furious with her because Amy didn't want to have sex with him. So when this neighbor saw the coat on Sunday morning, and then she knocked on Amy's door and Amy didn't answer, this neighbor went and got Amy's keys from the landlord, and when she went inside and realized it was empty, she called the police. Detective Young had never in his life had so many witnesses volunteer to help out on a case, and every single witness story really seemed to point the finger at Eric. And it was easy to imagine Eric being mad after driving all the way to Maine from Florida only to be rejected, and the neighbor's story was especially damning for Eric, because it meant that Eric was already enraged that Amy wouldn't sleep with him the day before Amy had left him for two other guys at the pavilion. And Detective Young thought Eric's story about driving to Amy's house and sleeping in his car on a night when the weather was in the low 40s, so nearly freezing outside, was nonsense. But when Young went back in to question Eric about all of this, Eric did something very unexpected. He said he had proof that he drove to Amy's apartment late on the night she disappeared. Then he pulled out a receipt from a gas station, which was located on the way to Amy's apartment. And Eric told Detective Young that if this receipt wasn't enough, he also had a witness. On his drive to Amy's, he had to pass through a toll, but he didn't have any money. And the toll taker had basically taken pity on him and let him through anyway, and so as a result of that, Eric was confident she would remember him. By now, Detective Young's head was spinning. This was the most chaotic interview he had ever conducted. Usually, investigators had to hunt for tips but tonight they were pouring in too fast for him to even keep up with. The detective felt like Eric really was his best suspect, but Russ had been the last person to see Amy alive, so he couldn't be ruled out yet. But this actually wasn't even the biggest question that Detective Young faced, because Amy's disappearance actually wasn't officially a criminal case at all. Amy was an adult, and she had only been gone for two days. Her friends and family were obviously worried, but as of now, there was no evidence that any crime had even been committed. Amy might actually be just fine. Some of the other detectives thought Detective Young was kind of overreacting. They thought Amy was going to waltz in any minute, wondering what all the fuss was about. The next morning, so three days after Amy disappeared, police went to her apartment to go look around. They found the key to her apartment sitting on the tire of her car, exactly the way Eric had described. But when they found Eric's angry note he had left inside, they discovered that it was much nastier than Eric had said it was. In the letter, Eric asked Amy very angrily where she'd gone, with a choice curse word thrown in. It was very clear Eric must have left feeling very mad, chucking Amy's coat as he left. When they searched Amy's apartment, the police took her computer, her mail, her answering machine, and even her diary. And as they flipped through the pages of her diary, they found pages of Amy's deepest thoughts, her struggles, her fears, and her hopes. But there was one name that kept coming up over and over again in this diary. It was Amy's ex, Richard Sparrow. In fact, she'd started this diary the day after she had broken up with him, 
So that day, the police picked Richard up at his house, they drove him to the station, and they put him in the same interrogation room where Detective Young had just questioned Eric the night before. And when Richard told the detective that he had slept over at Amy's place on the first night that Eric was visiting, Young felt his heart start to race. It was hard to imagine a more awkward or potentially explosive arrangement than having an ex-boyfriend sleeping on the couch while Amy's new man slept in the guest room. It was the type of situation where you could understand one or both of these men getting really mad. But Richard would tell Detective Young that truly he was on friendly terms with Amy and that he had only stayed in her apartment on Friday as a favor to her after she begged him to. And also, on the night that Amy disappeared, Richard said he went out in South Berwick with friends and then went home, an account that Richard's roommates all confirmed, which meant he was very likely many miles away from Portland when Amy went missing. So, this interview with Richard really had Detective Young turn his sights back towards Eric and Russ, the two men who were chasing Amy on the night she vanished. As the days went by with no word on the whereabouts of their daughter, Amy's parents became increasingly desperate. On Thursday, October 25th, almost a week after Amy disappeared, her mother Diane went to the media and offered a $35,000 reward for information that would lead to Amy's safe return. And by now, Amy's case was no longer an off-the-books investigation by Detective Young. This was now a full-scale police operation. As a reminder to himself of just what was at stake, Detective Young put a photo of Amy on his desk. By now, Detective Young was pretty sure he knew which one was responsible for Amy's disappearance, but he couldn't prove it. So for now, he was just going to treat Eric and Russ like equal suspects. When Young had checked both men's backgrounds, he'd found they both had criminal records. Russ was on probation for theft, and the night he gave Amy a ride, he was driving with a suspended license, and facing the prospect of having his license revoked entirely. Eric had some minor drug offenses on his record, but more alarming was his ex-girlfriend in Florida had a restraining order against him. Weirdly, her name was also Amy, and she even kind of looked like Amy St. Laurent. Police had begun a much more aggressive search for Amy. Sheriff's deputies retraced Eric's route from the nightclub back to Amy's apartment, checking anywhere that somebody might be able to hide a body, but they found nothing. Police in surrounding communities looked through abandoned buildings, and they searched the train tracks and highways and the edges of the harbor. National Guard helicopters searched from above, and detectives even spent their own time looking for Amy on weekends. But no one could find any trace of Amy. Meanwhile, both primary suspects left town. Eric went back to Florida, where he lived and worked, while Russ went to Alabama, since he had family there. Usually, Detective Young would want to keep his suspects close, but in this case, he was actually happy that both men had left. He figured the killer might relax once he was away from Portland, and maybe he might confess something to somebody close to him. Five weeks later, there was still no sign of Amy, and everyone at this point feared she was dead. Officers who had initially been skeptical that Amy was even in trouble were now drawn into the case out of real concern for the young woman. They'd learned so much about Amy during the investigation, not just the details of the last few days before she vanished, but the details of her life, how kind she was, and how spontaneously generous. One couple told police that Amy gave them money out of her savings one Christmas when they didn't have money to buy presents for their kid. Another friend told police that Amy one time had paid for a plane ticket so the friend could fly home to celebrate her parents' 50th wedding anniversary. Amy even took a leave of absence from work to stay at a friend's bedside when they were in a coma in the hospital. Some of the officers began referring to Amy as, quote, our Amy, almost like they were her father. Detective Young found himself constantly looking at that photo of Amy he kept on his desk, and whenever he looked at her, he felt like she was looking back at him, pleading with him to help her. And as time dragged on without any breakthrough, people in Portland began getting scared that a killer was literally on the loose among them. And you gotta remember that this was around the time right after 9-11, so Americans at this time were very much on edge. And now Amy's disappearance had only made the paranoia much worse for people in Portland. As the lead detective in the hunt for Amy, Detective Young felt like so far he was letting the public down, especially her family, 
But he didn't really know what else to do. Without a body, he had no crime scene and no evidence, and so he was totally stalled. And that's when Detective Young got an unusual offer. A lieutenant from the main warden service named Pat Dorian thought he might be able to help find Amy. Every year, Dorian and his team found over 300 lost hikers, mostly people who got turned around inside of Maine's vast forests. Even though they'd never looked for a dead body before, the lieutenant thought the wardens might be able to apply their expertise to this case. Detective Young wasn't sure that a bunch of game wardens could help, but winter was coming, and once there was snow on the ground, finding a body would be much more difficult, if not impossible. So Detective Young told the lieutenant that yes, he would like his help. So on Monday, December 3rd, which was six weeks after Amy had vanished, Detective Young squeezed into a crowded conference room at the police station and took a seat at the conference table. Detective Young's team sat on one side and Lieutenant Dorian's on the other, all of them looking over a table full of equipment, computers, and mapping programs. Detective Young began by showing the wardens all the places the police had already searched. But Dorian really wanted to know more about the suspects, so his team could get a better sense of where either man might go to dispose of a body. So Dorian asked questions like, how familiar were they with the woods and the outdoors? And were they the kind of people who would feel comfortable hiking into an unfamiliar area? Detective Young decided he would just focus on the one suspect he was pretty sure was responsible for Amy's disappearance, which by this point he fully expected was a murder. It was a gamble what he was doing, but in his experience, Young had seen that the more focused a search is, the better the results. So for hours, the people at this table, Dorian, Young, their teams, discussed every detail of the case, and about the one suspect that he was focusing on. But a question from the wardens caught the detectives by surprise. Did their suspect have access to a shovel? And surprisingly, despite all their interviews and questions, none of the detectives had any idea. So immediately after the meeting, Detective Young asked other investigators to find out whether the suspect had a shovel. And right away, word came back that the suspect did have a shovel, and in fact, he had borrowed the shovel recently. Five days later, at 6.30 a.m. on December 8, 2001, a new, massive search for Amy began. 100 officers and 45 Maine search and rescue volunteers fanned out across southern Maine, along with cadaver dogs that are trained to smell dead bodies. But after hours of searching, the team found nothing. The cadaver dogs indicated that they smelled something a few times, but it turned out to just be nothing but dead animals. Then, around 1 p.m., searchers turned down a side road off the highway that had been used to haul gravel to expand the road. At the end were trails that led off into the brush and some debris from the construction. With snow closing in, the searchers spread out in a line shoulder to shoulder and marched into the woods just as they had at other potential burial spots. And after about 30 minutes of this, one of the searchers ducked under a branch and they came upon a spot where the earth seemed to have been pressed down and kind of smoothed over. So the searchers brought over the dogs and right away the dogs were barking and pointing at that spot on the ground. Searchers immediately yelled out for Detective Young to come over, and when he did come over and he looked down at the spot, he could see there were some pine needles that had been thrown over this area, almost like to disguise it, and so it seemed very likely this was a burial spot. And sure enough, when searchers got their shovels and began digging in that spot, they would uncover Amy's badly decomposed body. The next day, Sunday, December 9th, the medical examiner conducted Amy's autopsy. And from this autopsy, it was clear that Amy had been beaten and shot. But there wasn't much other physical evidence to go on. There were no fingerprints or DNA from the killer on the body. In fact, her body was so decomposed that the medical examiner needed Amy's dental records just to confirm it was really her. Five days later, on Friday, December 14th, Amy's family held a memorial for her at a funeral home in South Portland. 25 white candles surrounded a photo of Amy, one for every year of her life. Beside the memorial sat a bouquet of pink roses, just like the flowers that her father would give her every year for her birthday. Detective Young would have loved to be at Amy's service, but he couldn't go because at that very moment, he was in his car driving south on his way to pick up the killer. Even though the killer had left the state, detectives had kept a close eye on him. And when Amy's body was found, they finally got their break because the killer had believed police would never find the body, and so when they did, the killer panicked. 
He called someone and he confessed to the crime. Finally, all the pieces fell together, and for the first time, Detective Young knew what really happened to Amy. In the early morning hours of Sunday, October 21st, the killer asked Amy if she wanted a ride home. At least that's what he told her he was going to do, because in reality, the killer had other plans in mind. When Amy got in the car, the killer kept staring at her. He thought she was absolutely stunning, and he was sure that if he could just make the right move, something might happen romantically between them. So he turned on the radio, found a good song, and began to drive. Eventually, the killer got onto the highway, at which point Amy told him he was going the wrong way. The killer told her that he was just going to take her for a moonlit walk. It was going to be great. But Amy said she had no interest in that and just wanted to be taken home. But the killer wasn't prepared to do that. So he pulled off the highway to a secluded spot, and he turned to Amy and said, please, just give me a chance. Then he told her how pretty she was and how attracted he was to her, hoping this might make her want to stay out longer with him, but it only made her more agitated, and she eventually demanded to be taken home right now. And at first, the killer did begin driving back on the highway as if he was going to take her home, but then he turned down a side road, at which point Amy began screaming at him to turn around and bring me home right now. The killer could feel anger boiling up inside of him to the point where he just couldn't control it anymore, so he pulled the car over on the side of the road, he put it in park, and then he turned and just wound up and punched Amy. Stunned, Amy leapt out of the car and just began running. But the killer had more than just fists to hurt Amy with. He grabbed a gun from under the seat and then ran out after her. And when he caught up to her, he couldn't contain his anger. He hit her again across the face with the gun, splitting her lip and chipping her tooth. Then he hit her for a third time, this time hard enough to break a bone in her face. Amy tried to fight back, but her killer was much stronger and he knocked her to the ground and pinned her down. They struggled for a while, and at some point, the killer tore at Amy's clothes and sexually assaulted her. And then when he was done, he grabbed his gun again. He knew if he were to let Amy go, he'd get in big trouble. So instead, he put that gun to the right side of Amy's head and he pulled the trigger. The killer knew he needed to hide the body now, but he knew he couldn't do much in the dark. So he dragged her body into the nearby forest where she was out of sight, and then he left her for the night. And then the next day, he returned with a shovel and he buried her. Even before Amy's body was found, Detective Young had already begun to suspect one person much more than anybody else. Detectives actually managed to find surveillance video of Eric at a gas station alone at 1.36 a.m. on the night Amy went missing, just as Eric had claimed. They also found the turnpike toll taker who remembered taking pity on Eric when he couldn't pay the toll. And so with all that corroboration, police didn't think it was possible for Eric to have returned to Portland to pick up Amy by 2 a.m., the time Russ said he had dropped her off. But police had a harder time verifying Russ's claim that he had driven Amy from his apartment to the Portland nightclub and then returned home in just 25 minutes. Russ's roommates had vouched for him, but their stories didn't hold up. His roommate claimed he knew Russ came in around 2.25 a.m. because he was in the middle of writing an email to his aunt when Russ walked in. But when police looked through his emails, there was no record that he actually sent any email to his aunt. And police could not find a single person who actually saw Russ drop off Amy at the pavilion. Instead, police found evidence that Russ was lying. He got pulled over by police on the night that Amy went missing at around 3.14 a.m. for not dimming his high beam lights. So clearly, he hadn't come home quickly and then stayed home like he had claimed, because here he was, out and about at 3.14. Then, after Amy disappeared, police found that Russ had borrowed a shovel from his mom's boyfriend, and the location of her body where she was buried, it was found less than four-tenths of a mile from Russ's mother's house. And in addition to all that evidence, Russ actually just confessed the entire crime to his mother after news broke that Amy's body had been found. On Monday, June 30th, 2003, Russ Gorman was convicted of killing Amy and sentenced to 60 years in prison. 
Amy's mother would go on to found the Amy St. Laurent Foundation, which was set up to help educate women and children of all ages in awareness, prevention, and techniques to protect themselves in dangerous or life-threatening situations. The organization is still active today. In the early morning hours of March 11th, 1989, four young men who were all in their 20s and all very close friends left their homes in East Texas and headed south. Nine hours later, they arrived in the beautiful resort town of South Padre Island, which is just off the coast of Southern Texas. They were there to enjoy their spring break by sunning on the beach, drinking in bars, and meeting girls. When they finally arrived that night, they were so exhausted from the trip that they went right to bed. The next morning when they got up, they went straight down to the beach and they had some drinks. And then by the afternoon, they were talking amongst themselves and they decided that for their first full night of being on vacation, they would kick things off with a bang and they would go into Mexico and party there. And so they piled into their car and they drove an hour southwest to Brownsville, Texas, which is a town that sits right on the border of Mexico. And when they got there, they parked their car and then walked right over the footbridge that crossed the Rio Grande River into Mexico. On the other side, in Mexico, they found themselves in the town of Matamoros, which is very popular amongst spring break goers for their bars and their clubs. And so the four friends got a quick bite to eat at a hamburger joint, and then they made their way into the bars and the clubs, and they danced and they drank for hours. And then at some point, they got tired and left the bar scene. They crossed over the footbridge back into the U.S. and made their way back to their hotel in South Padre Island. The next morning, when they got up and they recovered from their hangover, they decided they had so much fun in Matamoros the night before that they had to go back. And so that night, they piled back into their car, they drove back down to Brownsville, Texas, they crossed over that footbridge into Mexico, and then all night they partied and danced and had a great time. And then at some point, the four decided it was time to leave, and so they left their bar and began walking towards the footbridge. But that night, it was so crowded in Matamoros that you could barely move a foot without bumping into someone. And so the foursome split into two separate pairs. And the lead pair, they made their way ahead, and they stopped at the gift shop right at the foot of that bridge going back to the U.S. side, and there they waited for the trail pair. The trail pair, which consisted of Mark Kilroy and Bill Huddleston, they weren't far behind, but they got sidetracked when Mark saw a girl standing next to a house that he had seen earlier in the night, and he just wanted to go up and talk to her and say bye to her. And so they go over to this girl, and while Mark is talking to her, Bill moves on ahead and goes down an alleyway to urinate, and then when he comes back out, Mark and this girl are not there. Bill assumed Mark must have just moved on the little ways up to the bridge where the other two friends were at the gift shop, and so after looking around for just a couple of seconds, Bill makes his way up to the bridge, and he meets up with the other two friends. And when he gets there, he asks the other two friends, you know, where's Mark? Did he come up here already? And they say, no, we haven't seen him. And so now the trio is a little bit concerned, but they're thinking, okay, he must be with this girl he had seen. And so they backtracked a little ways and they looked for Mark. They went back to where he had been talking to that girl. And again, he wasn't there. And so they decided, okay, he must have already crossed the bridge and made it to our car. And he's probably just waiting for us over there. And so the trio crosses over the bridge into the U.S. side. They get to their car and Mark's not there. And so at this point, they are pretty concerned about Mark, but they eventually convince themselves that he must have just left with this girl and they probably are back at the hotel together. And so after a little while, the trio decides, let's just go back to the hotel. We're bound to find Mark. And so they drive all the way back to South Padre Island. They get to their hotel room and Mark's not there. But again, they tell themselves he's not here because he's probably with this girl in another room. And so they don't worry about him. They go to bed. But the next morning, when Mark still had not come back to the hotel room, they decide, you know what? Something's wrong here. We have to tell police. And so they file a missing person report, but the police get so many of these about spring breakers who go missing in Matamoros that they don't really take them seriously at first, because typically the missing person will just show up 24 hours later with a horrible hangover and no memory of how they got back from Matamoros. And so the police were expecting this to happen with Mark, but after 24 hours when Mark didn't show up with a bad hangover, they were convinced that something had happened to him, and American and Mexican police suspected foul play because Matamoros and the surrounding areas are not exactly safe for tourists, but they didn't have any leads, and so Mark's case languished. Three weeks later, a drug smuggler drove through a police checkpoint without stopping just outside of Matamoros. And so the police pursued him, and this guy ultimately stopped at this secluded ranch up in the mountains. After the police arrested the smuggler, they noticed a ranch worker was standing nearby, and on a whim, they showed him a picture of Mark and said, hey, have you seen this guy? And the worker, despite being scared and not really sure what to do, he said to police, yeah, I have seen him here. The smuggler and his friends, they brought him here in handcuffs. And then the worker turned around and pointed up the mountain towards the shack. It was about 400 yards up the mountain. And he said, that's where they took him. 
And so authorities began walking up the hillside towards the shack. And when they got about 100 yards away, they saw this big metal cauldron sitting on the front stoop of the shack. And then when they got about 50 yards away, they were hit with this horrible smell of death and decay. And then when they got right up in front of the shack and could see inside of this cauldron and inside of the shack itself, what they saw was so gruesome and horrible that even the most senior and grizzled responding officers were totally shaken up by it. Under intense questioning, the drug smuggler that had originally led police up to the secluded ranch and the shack admitted that he was a part of a gang and that his gang had taken Mark. Three weeks earlier, while Bill was urinating in that alleyway, Mark spoke to that girl he wanted to see, and then she went off, and then Mark was left standing alone waiting for Bill to come back. And while he was waiting, a man on the street parked in a red truck yelled out to him to come over. He needed help or something. He lured him to the truck. And so Mark went over to the truck, and then right when he asked the man, you know, what do you need, two men, one of which included this drug smuggler, jumped out from behind a building and tried to grab Mark and put him inside of this red truck. Mark was a very fit, big, athletic guy, and so he was able to fight the two men off and then took off running down the road. But he only made it about two blocks when another car full of gangsters showed up, cut him off, and then at gunpoint got him to come into the second vehicle. And so once he was restrained inside of this vehicle, they drove him out of the town of Matamoros onto some backcountry roads up into the mountains to this secluded ranch where they left him overnight in the car. The next morning, the gang members came back out and they wrapped duct tape around Mark's mouth and his whole face and his eyes. They just left a little slit around his nostrils so he could breathe. And then they pulled him out of the vehicle with his hands tied behind his back and they walked him up the hill to that shack. This gang that had abducted Mark that this drug smuggler was a part of was more like a cult. And this cult was led by a man named Constanzo who practiced a form of black magic called Palo. Constanzo would perform Palo rituals, which he claimed to his followers would make he and all of them invincible. These rituals, which took place in the shack up in the mountains, involved human sacrifice. Constanzo would tell his followers that these people who were going to be sacrificed, they didn't just need to die, they needed to die screaming. Because Constanzo believed the more agony he inflicted on his victims before they ultimately died and were sacrificed to the gods, the more power the gods would grant to he and his followers. And so the people who got kidnapped and marched up to that shack to be sacrificed were subjected to unspeakable atrocities, and Mark had been selected to be the next ritual sacrifice. After Mark was led out of the vehicle with his face all taped up, he was walked up to that shack where he spent several horrifying hours with Constanzo and his cronies, and then at some point Mark was killed when a machete was brought down on the back of his neck. Afterwards, Mark's brain was removed and placed into their sacred cauldron and boiled, and then Mark's legs were removed, and then a long wire was inserted into Mark's torso and fished around inside of him until they hooked it onto his spinal column, and then they buried his torso and his legs, and they left that wire protruding from his body up out of the dirt. There was basically a lead poking out of the ground. And the reason they did that was because later on, they could just pull on that wire and pull up Mark's bones and use his bones to make jewelry. Mark's body was one of 15 discovered in and around this shack. The total number of people that Constanzo and his cult ritualistically murdered is at least 16, but believed to be closer to 26. However, the police were not able to get the official number from Constanzo because Constanzo had his followers shoot and kill him before the police could get to him. Five other cult members were ultimately convicted for their roles in the cult's murders, and they were each given a sentence of over 60 years in prison. The next and final story of today's episode is called The Most Feared Girl in Mexico. The Sierra Madre Oriental is a major mountain range that starts on the southern border of Texas and Mexico and cuts 700 miles south through the northeastern section of Mexico. About halfway down this mountain range on the eastern face lies a series of caves. And situated below these caves at the foot of the mountains are several small villages that are very isolated and they're populated primarily with illiterate poor farmers. One night back in May of 1963, a 14-year-old boy named Sebastian Guerrero, who lived in one of these small isolated villages, decided to go for a walk up in the mountains and he wanted to go explore the different caves. Now, this was something he did fairly regularly because there was a local rumor that there was actually hidden treasure in these different caves. Now, it's unclear if Sebastian literally believed that or if that was just kind of an excuse to go have a look around himself. But regardless, he headed out of his house and he began walking up the mountain towards these caves. 
The entrance to these caves were a couple hundred feet up the mountainside, and then each of the various entrances, which ranged in size from fairly small to enormous, were spread out a couple of miles in each direction. So Sebastian starts walking up the mountain towards the first entrance he can see. It's dark outside, he's got no flashlight, he's just walking up. And as he's walking, he notices off to his right, fairly far away from where he was, there was light coming out of one of the cave entrances. And he had never recalled seeing light coming out of any of these caves. Nobody ever went in these caves, especially not at night. And so his interest was piqued, and he decided he would kind of abandon his original plan to just kind of look around near his village, and he would actually walk all the way over to that lit up cave and see what was going on. So he turned right and began kind of walking uphill at an angle in the direction of this lit up cave. And so as he's walking, he's getting farther and farther away from the village where he lives, and he's starting to hear sounds coming out of this lit up cave entrance. It sounds like a person potentially, either they're laughing or they're screaming, he doesn't really know. He's thinking, you know, maybe someone's having a party inside one of these caves, he has no idea. But after he gets maybe two or three hundred feet away from this entrance, he realizes it's definitely a person and they're definitely screaming. And it does not sound like they're screaming out of joy. It sounds like they're screaming because they're scared or they're in pain. And as he's getting closer and closer and closer to this cave, his anxiety is starting to ramp up because he's really starting to be frightened by what he's hearing. And he's starting to realize there's more than one person inside of this cave. In addition to the person that is screaming out, there also sounds to be a large contingent of other people that are either singing in unison or chanting in unison, but some group of people are doing something in unison while some other person is screaming out. And so he's really starting to get nervous about this cave, but he just can't help feeling curious about what was going on. And so he just continued walking until he was maybe 10 feet away from the entrance to this cave, and he plopped down behind a rock. And so he's not really sure if it's a good idea to look. He doesn't want to be spotted by whoever is in there. But finally, he kind of works up the courage. He takes a deep breath and he slips out from behind the rock and he goes right to the edge of this big opening, maybe 10 foot across opening. And he peeks his head right around the edge of the opening and he looks inside and what he sees causes him to just freeze in terror. Then his survival instincts just kick in and he turns and he starts running down the mountain away from this cave. He has no idea if he's been spotted or not, but he's sensing that someone could be chasing him. And so he is just running as if his life depended on it. And he would not run back to his village. Instead, he would run nearly 10 miles to the nearest police station. And when he gets there, he busts through the front doors and he's totally hysterical. He's drenched in sweat and the police officers are totally caught off guard. And so they're trying to tell him to calm down. And so Sebastian finally would kind of compose himself. But then he just was not able to describe what he had seen inside of this cave. Whatever he had seen, he knew it was bad, but the words were just escaping him. And so the way he described it to police was he basically thought he saw vampires. And as soon as he began describing vampires to the police, they're thinking to themselves, okay, I don't know what's going on with this kid, but this just cannot be serious. And so they consoled him and kind of calmed him down and said, look, kid, you know, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, if there's any news that comes out of something happening in the cave that's bad, you know, I'm sure we'll hear about it and we'll follow up. But for now, we're just going to bring you back to your village. And so at this, Sebastian was really frustrated and he was kind of pleading with the police like, no, you got to take me seriously. There's something bad happening in this cave. Someone could be hurt. Someone could be dying. I don't know, but you got to go to this cave. You got to go see what's going on. But the police at this point, they're just not really interested. And so they ultimately do just drive him back to his village. And so he goes back into his home. The police go back to their station and everyone just kind of goes to bed for the night. The next day when Sebastian wakes up, he just can't shake what he saw inside of that cave. And so he would once again run back to the police station. And when he got there, he began pleading with the police, like, you gotta go, you gotta go see what's inside of this cave. I'm telling you, there's something awful in there. And this time, one of the police officers, his name was Luis Martinez, he would say, you know, okay, kid, bring me to this cave and, and I'll have a look around. And so Luis and Sebastian, who was very grateful, they left the police station, they hopped in a police car and they took off. And then later on in the day, the other police officers who were not really paying attention to this cave thing, they realized that Luis and the boy had not returned yet. And Luis had not checked in via his radio. 
And so at some point in the afternoon that day, the other officers began calling out to Luis. They began calling him on his radio and trying to figure out what's going on, but he wasn't responding. And so the police thought that was odd, but they thought, you know what, I'm sure he'll be back soon. There's got to be an explanation for this. But the rest of the day would go by without Luis reaching out to them, and he didn't return with the boy. And so by that evening, the other officers were genuinely concerned that, you know, something bad had happened to their colleague. And so they tried calling Luis a few more times on the radio. It didn't work. And so the officers, they made their way over to Sebastian's village and they found Sebastian's family, believing that, you know, maybe the boy was back and he could give some insight into where Luis went. But when they talked to Sebastian's family, they would say, hey, you know, he's not back yet either. And so both Sebastian and Luis at this point have not talked to anyone all day and they are missing. And so the police at this point, they realize this is an emergency. They need to figure out where these two went. And so they were kind of understaffed. And so they contacted the Mexican army and they explained, you know, we're missing one of our colleagues. We're missing a child from this village. And so the Mexican army would actually send out a military unit to assist them in going and finding these two people. And so the unit, they show up later that night and the police and the Mexican army, they head out to where this cave was. And when they saw what was inside the cave, it would shock the world. To understand what was found inside of this cave, we need to go back six months to December of 1962. That month, two brothers, Santos and Cayetano Hernandez, who made their living basically traveling around Mexico, stealing from people and swindling people, they decided they were going to pull off their biggest heist yet. They were going to rip off an entire town. Their plan was to go into a small, fairly isolated village that was populated primarily with poor and illiterate people, and they would go in there and they would convince the villagers that they, the brothers, were actually prophets of an exiled Incan god. And if these villagers did everything they said, they would make them rich. And so the village the brothers identified as their target was a place called La Yerba Buena, which was located right at the foot of the Sierra Madre Oriental, right below where that cave was that Luis and Sebastian went to investigate. And La Yerba Buena was exactly what the brothers were looking for. It was home to only about 20 families that were all very poor and illiterate, and they were very suggestible. And so right before the new year, the Hernandez brothers strolled into La Yerba Buena and they put on this very dramatic show explaining how they were the prophets of the sinking God. And these two brothers, they were very charismatic and they were excellent salesmen. And so they really sold the lie. And these villagers who were very vulnerable and cut off really from the rest of the world, they believed them. They thought this was their big break. They're going to be rich. We just have to do whatever they say. And so almost immediately, the villagers effectively became the Hernandez brothers' slaves. They would give them anything they wanted and do anything they wanted. But after a couple of months of this, some of the villagers started to be frustrated with the Hernandez brothers, the prophets, because it seemed like they were not really working towards making the villagers rich. Instead, it just seemed like they were horribly mistreating the villagers. And it just didn't feel like this was a relationship that was benefiting the villagers. And so when this sentiment began to kind of make its way around the 70-ish people who lived in La Yerba Buena, the brothers picked up on it and they could have at that point just kind of abandoned their gig. At this point, you know, they've robbed the town dry. There's nothing left for them to give to the brothers. But for whatever reason, the brothers decide instead to salvage their operation. And so the brothers, they leave the village and they go to a city that's relatively close by and they recruit this young woman named Magdalena Solis. She was a prostitute and they tell her, hey, you know, we have this con we're doing in La Yerba Buena where we're pretending to be prophets of this Incan God and they're starting not to believe our lie. And so we need you, if you're willing, to come with us and pretend to be an actual Incan goddess. And so when you show up, they'll know that we were serious, that we have a direct line to the Incan gods and goddesses, and they'll believe us again, and they'll fall back in line. And so Magdalena, she likes the idea of participating in this con, and so she agrees to do it in exchange for some money. And so she, along with the Hernandez brothers and Magdalena's brother, his name was Eliezer, and he functioned as her pimp, those four people, they went back to Yerba Buena. And when they got there, the Hernandez brothers snuck Magdalena past all the villagers up to that cave up in the mountains. And they put her in the back of the cave, they kind of hid her behind some rocks, and they dressed her up in an Incan goddess costume. And then once she was in there, the brothers went back down to the village and they rounded all the villagers up and said, come on, let's go up to the cave. We have a special ceremony for you. 
And so the villagers made their way up to this cave, and once they were all inside, the Hernandez brothers used some basic magic tricks and created basically a smokescreen. Once they had the smokescreen kind of billowing in the back of the cave, they secretly signaled to Magdalena, who was behind the smoke screen, and she knew that was her cue, and she leapt through the smoke, and she presented herself to the villagers for the first time, and she declared herself to be a reincarnated Incan goddess, and if you don't do what I tell you to do, I'm going to kill you. And so the message she was sending to the villagers was so intense, they completely believed that this was an Incan goddess, and therefore this was not a ruse. The brothers were not lying to them. This was all very real. There's a real goddess in front of us. And so they immediately fell right back in line. The plan worked exactly as the brothers wanted it to. However, there was an element of their plan they could not possibly have accounted for. And that was what Magdalena did next. Even though Magdalena was fully aware that what she was getting herself into was an act, it was a con, it was not real. Despite that, as soon as she jumped through the smoke and was standing in front of the villagers for the first time and saw the looks on these people's faces as they stared up at her and she saw their reverence for her, it had this profound impact on her. This is a woman who's never had control in her life. She's been a prostitute since a young age and here she is the most powerful person in the room, and it's not even close. And it got to her head. And so when she left the cave that night, she literally believed she was a reincarnated Incan goddess. And she was not a merciful one. Within the first few days of her stay at La Yerba Buena, Magdalena used threats of violence on the villagers to completely take over the village. She very easily supplanted the Hernandez brothers at the top of the power structure. Now, the Hernandez brothers probably were quite surprised to see this happen because they were expecting Magdalena to play more of a prop role to keep them in power, not the other way around. But ultimately, they kind of just went along with it because through Magdalena's control over the villagers, they were able to continue to exploit the villagers, and so they were getting what they wanted out of this relationship. Within a few weeks of being in La Yerba Buena, Magdalena was not only abusing every villager in every horrible way imaginable, she also was becoming completely delusional. She convinced herself that in order to survive, she needed to start drinking blood. And so she demanded all the villagers provide her with blood. And so in fear of retribution, the villagers began slaughtering all of their farm animals and their own pets so Magdalena could drink their blood. For weeks and weeks and weeks, the horrible abuse Magdalena would dole out on the villagers would continue, and these blood rituals would continue. And then finally, sometime in April, two of the villagers decided, you know what, I've had enough. I don't believe Magdalena is actually an Incan goddess. I don't believe the Hernandez brothers are actually prophets. I think this is all a scam. And so they decided the way they would handle this is they were just going to flee the village. Now, somehow, their plans to run away got out, and the Hernandez brothers found out about it, and they, in turn, told Magdalena about it, and when she heard the news, she immediately told everyone in the village to make their way up to the cave for a special ceremony. So all the villagers, including the two people that were planning on running away, they made their way up to the cave, and once everyone was inside, Magdalena walked to the front of the group and she pointed at the two dissenters, the two people that were planning on running, and she demanded that the rest of the villagers kill them. And on the spot, all of the other villagers jumped on top of the two dissenters and they lynched them. They beat them to death in the cave. And then after these two people have been killed, Magdalena orders their bodies be strung up on these two pikes she had set up in the back of the cave because she knew what she was going to be doing up in this cave. And so after these two bodies were strung up on these pikes, Magdalena grabs a chalice and she walks over to these two bodies and she presses the chalice up against their bodies where they're bleeding from and she fills it up and then she drinks from the chalice. And at this point, everything changed. Suddenly, Magdalena understood that it wasn't good enough to just be drinking animal blood. That was not enough to keep her, a goddess, alive. She now could only consume human blood. 
And so for the next several weeks, periodically, Magdalena would order everyone in the village to go back up to the cave for a blood ritual, which they all knew what this entailed. This no longer had anything to do with animals. This was human blood rituals. She would order them up and they would have no idea who was going to be the sacrifice. And so all these people, they get inside this dark cave and then Magdalena shows up and she stands in front of them. And after kind of looking them over, she identifies her next sacrifice and out of fear, the other villagers who were the friends and family of the victim would launch themselves on top of the chosen sacrifice and lynch them in the cave. And then afterwards, their body would be strung up on one of the pikes and Magdalena would walk over with her chalice. She would fill it with blood and she would drink it. And so this would go on and on for several weeks. And one of the most distressing aspects of these human sacrifices is that as she did more and more and more of them, Magdalena got it in her head that beating the sacrifice to death before consuming their blood was spoiling the blood in some way. And so what she began doing was she would have the other villagers beat the sacrifice into submission, and then she would have the sacrifice strung up to one of the pikes while they were still alive, and then she would carve their heart out while they were alive, and then she would drink their blood. So in May of 1963, when Sebastian, the 14-year-old boy, when he poked his head around and looked into that cave, he watched one of these sacrifices having their heart cut out and he didn't know what to make of it. And so he ran to the police. And then the next day, he and the police officer, Luis Martinez, they would go back to the cave and Magdalena and her cult would spot them, capture them and drag them both into the cave. And both of them would be ritualistically sacrificed. They would have their hearts cut out and Magdalena would drink their blood. When the police and army arrived in La Yerba Buena, it was a ghost town because all of the villagers had been ordered up to the cave where they had barricaded themselves inside with weapons because Magdalena probably knew there was going to be a big police response because one of their officers has gone missing out here. They're bound to be found out. And so when the police and the army reached the cave, there's this big shootout with all of the villagers. And during the shootout, the majority of the villagers are killed also, the Hernandez brothers, they're also killed in the shootout. And then after the shootout stops, the police and the army would go into this cave and they would discover the pikes, the bloody pikes that are in the back of the cave with bits of human remains all over the ground. And then they would leave the cave and they would search the town and they would find the remains of Luis and Sebastian outside a particular shack. And then inside the shack was Magdalena and her brother, Eliezer. They were still alive. They were trying to hide from the authorities. And so they would be arrested. It's believed Magdalena sacrificed and drank the blood of at least 15 of the villagers over a six week period. However, the only remains to be positively identified were Luis Martinez and Sebastian Guerrero. Ultimately, Magdalena and her brother Eliezer were sentenced to 50 years in prison and all of the surviving villagers who participated in these sacrifices or who participated in the shootout with police and the army they were given 30 years in prison. Amazingly, none of the villagers ever testified against Magdalena or her brother, despite the fact they were almost certainly offered reduced sentences in exchange for their testimony. Clearly, they were more terrified of the Incan goddess than they were terrified of the prospect of 30 years in prison. Although the exact date of when this happened is not known, Magdalena would eventually die behind bars.
Thank you for listening to the Mr. Ballin podcast. If you got something out of this episode and you haven't done this already, please put a metal fork in the five star review buttons microwave, set it for 99 minutes, hit start and then leave their house. Also, please subscribe to the Mr. Ballin podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon, Google and anywhere else you get your podcasts. This podcast airs every Monday and Thursday morning, but in the meantime, you can always watch one of the hundreds of stories I have posted on my YouTube channel, which is just called Mr. Ballin. If you want to get in touch with me, please follow me on any major social media platform and then send me a direct message. My username is just at Mr. Ballin, and I really do read the majority of my DMs. Lastly, we have some really cool merchandise, so head on over to shopmrballin.com to have a look. So that's going to do it. I really appreciate your support. Until next time, see ya.